we should have people popping in now. All right, and I'm going to go on mute. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Process Control Qualitative and Quantitative uh, Quality Control in Anatomic Pathology Case Review. Um, hopefully, all of you received the four cases that we're going to go through uh, in just a minute. Um, and But I just wanted to remind you, if you have um, questions during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will try to answer those questions at uh, if they're pertaining to a case at the end of each case, and then we'll do questions at the end. If you have a technical problem, please put that in the chat so that our um, team in the background can help you if you have a technical issue. Uh, and then otherwise, we will, we will go through the conversation in the q and So my name is Dan Milner. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Um, and my background is in both anatomic and clinical pathology. And I practiced in Boston at the Brigham Women's Hospital for about 16 years in infectious disease uh, and microbiology, as well as autopsy pathology. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is the process control that we have to use in anatomic pathology, uh, both quantitative and qualitative. The challenge with anatomic pathology, for those of you who work in an anatomic pathology lab, this will be very clear, is that there's not a lot of number-based data, right? There are uh, pHs of solutions, there are temperatures of refrigerators and freezers and um, other uh, other sort of ventilation hood controls and filtration rates of formalin, all these sorts of data about the environment where the work is happening or the reagents, et cetera, that are used to do that. But the actual production in anatomic pathology is primarily a visual output, right? We are trying to produce a glass slide either from cytology cells or from histology slide, et cetera, that could be coming from a live patient or an autopsy patient for a pathologist to ultimately review and make a subjective diagnosis. Um, and that, that makes the quality control piece a little bit challenging because we don't have trends we can follow normally or easily uh, like we do in the chemistry lab or the hematology lab, or we don't have machines that are generating numbers or data uh, that we can look at over time or look at a specific outlier to figure out what's going on. It's very difficult to do CV, right, coefficient of variation, because we can't repeatedly, you know, process a slide over and over again and get a different result. We're going to get the same result, which is a slide that we can either read or we can't read. So it, it becomes very challenging to do that, but there are some quantitative aspects, which I hopefully will highlight some examples with these cases. And then there are obviously the qualitative aspects, um, which are a bit more obvious and require a little bit more um, control and process uh, by the technical staff and the pathologist working together um, to do that. So let's just jump right into the cases um, and we will go from there. 
So the first case was a senior pathologist in your laboratory is complaining that the quality of the H&E stating is off. Doesn't give you any more details than that, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this. Certainly, um, I've seen our technical staff, our laboratorians experience this in, in the labs I've worked in. I've seen many pathologists look at a slide and say, there's just something wrong with the slide, but they can't really verbalize it because they're not, they don't, they don't really understand what about artifacts or what the histology lab does. So they don't know for sure what it is. They may have learned that, for example, what we see in this image is called chatter, uh, but they don't necessarily know what that means or how to fix it, right? So he asks that you fix it, right? But he doesn't give you any other details. And this is this is a very common scenario. So you review the h &E's from the last two weeks randomly, meaning you just go and you look at, at random images and you find the following images. So here's image one, and this is obviously some histology, an h &E slide from the colon. Uh, you can see glands with uh, inflammatory cells or, or interstitial cells between them, so this is colon. And you can see this, this artifact is here with these big chunks or slices through the tissue. Um, and this is often referred to as chatter. Um, and there are many different causes for it, but it, it means that the tissue is not a solid piece. It's got little cracks all along it. And notice that they're in a very linear pattern. They run parallel to each other. And that should give you a clue about, about why that's there. Here's the second slide. This is of uh, probably, um, not sure which tissue it is. I think it might be a lymph node, but you can see the same artifact is there. There's this, this chatter across the slide that's, that's causing this damage uh, to the tissue. Here's another slide, and again, it's that same concept. We've got skips in the tissue, but it's a little bit different. In the first two, we could see that there were, there were kind of consistent breaks at an interval, but these are longer intervals and a little bit different. So this may or may not be the same artifact, but it's certainly something that is abnormal and we wanna figure out what it is. And then the last image I provided for you, again, is that similar um, chatter effect, but notice it's happening this time on a special stain, right? So this isn't happening on just an H&E, it's happening on any uh, stain that's there. So I want to, we're going to try something new this week, um, which is uh, polling questions. So here's our first polling question. Hopefully everyone can see that polling question, and I'm going to launch it now. And you can answer this poll question. So please select um, what artifacts we see in this image. I'm gonna give you about a minute. We have plenty of time today. Uh, so I'm gonna give you about a minute so that everyone can answer. All right, great. We have about half of you answering, which is which is very good. Thank you so much. We're gonna we're gonna try to incorporate polling into all the sessions so we get more uh, direct feedback. So here's the here's the poll. Um, hopefully everybody can see this. So about fifty percent of you said there's chatter, and I said the word chatter, so I was hoping you would say there was chatter, and that is correct. Um, and there, there is the, that is one that is a, a kind of a general idea of what we're seeing is something called chatter. Chatter can be caused by poor fixation which is very important. Um, it can actually have some effects from excessive heat during fixation. Um, but that third example I showed you with the big gaps in it is actually probably a calcified block. That tissue is too calcified and it needs to be decalcified in order for that, that larger skip to happen. So for those of you who have more than one of these, that's correct, but all of you are correct. Um, there's definitely a series of artifacts here, both chatter and the effect chatter from calcified tissue and chatter from poor fixation. But there are other causes of chatter, including loose microtome blades, um, non-sharp microtome blades. The setting on the microtome is not, um, it's not uh, precise with the block. In other words, the facing of the block is not done correctly, so you can get some chatter there as well. So there's lots of different causes of chatter. So when you see chatter, it isn't something where you say, oh, I know how to fix that. It's more like, oh, I, I see that there's chatter. I need to investigate and see what that is. All right. Um, so now let us go on. Uh, okay. 
So what steps would we further take to isolate the cause of this problem, right? So we've, we've seen, and remember, we randomly looked across different blocks. So we didn't just look at one case from one day that the pathologist said was bad because the pathologist didn't give us any details. We just randomly selected some, some slides that we had in, in from the last couple of weeks, and we saw these different artifacts. So what steps would we further isolate to do to isolate the cause of the problem? Well, we need to know when did this start happening? You know, how long has it been happening? Did it happen from every processor run? Did it happen from every microtome in the lab? Did it happen from one particular technician? We don't know the answer to that question. So we have to create a, a, a have a process, right? A quality control process that is in this case qualitative to figure out what the source of that problem is. So for example, we can review a subset of cases from the same tissue processor run, right? So we know which blocks we know those slides we're looking at. We can look at our log books because we have really good records of when those blocks were run. We know the date and time and the tissue processor run that was done in. And we should know all the other blocks that were run there. So we can go and specifically take each of those four examples that we found and look at other cases that were run in the same tissue processor run to see did they also have chatter. If they didn't, um, if they we don't see that artifact, then we can say, okay, maybe it's something you know, more specific to the block or the processing of that block. But if we see that everything from that run had a similar artifact, then perhaps the processor run was bad and we can look at our processor um, settings and see, you know, perhaps what had happened. Maybe the tissues were, the, there was a failure of power and the, the tissue overfixed or underfixed. Maybe there was a surge in power and there was too much heat. We don't know, but we can isolate it to a processor run. If we don't find a processor run, then we can look at a subset of cases from the same microtome, right? We have a log book that says on the day that those slides were cut, what other slides were also cut by that technician on that block, on that, on that microtome, right? And for labs that are small that only have one microtome, this is very easy. But for labs that have three to four microtomes with three to four technicians who could use any one of those, this kind of record is very important to know which block was cut on which microtome by which technician on which day so that when you find an error, you can go back and, and determine what it was. So again, a subset of cases from the same microtome station, regardless of technician, would be the first step just to see if the microtome is off or the settings off. Maybe someone bang, bumped it and the settings are miscalibrated. Maybe the blade is loose. Maybe the screw that holds the blade in place is loose and you have to fix the system before that will cut again properly. And then if that isn't telling it, uh, maybe if that's not giving you the right answer, then you can go and say, is it maybe the same technician? Maybe this particular technician is drifting in their technique. Maybe they had an off day, like we don't know, but maybe perhaps the, all the cases they cut were an issue. And so then you can look at that and, and do that. And one of these three reviews, either the processor run, the microtome station, or the technician is going to explain three of those cases, right? Because three of the examples we saw were clearly chatter most likely related to either poor fixation or from um, a microtome uh, blade being loose or not quite set correctly. But that third block I showed you, that's going to require that we inspect the individual blocks, right? So those four that we found randomly, we want to look at those blocks and say, these blocks look okay. Is the tissue in good shape? Did it perfuse with formal, uh, perma, uh, from, uh, paraffin correctly, et cetera, et cetera. And for that third block, we would see that that block is calcified and we would need to surface decal it. And then we would be able to fix that block uh, going forward. So this is the, this is really the, the, process that you have to go through when you detect an error. Now, ideally, you would never have these errors. Everything would be cut perfectly. But when you do have something that isn't cut perfectly, this is the this is sort of the root cause process, which is the process control, a very qualitative way to do it, to figure out what is exactly wrong um, with these blocks. So just to remind everybody, histology is a visual profession. Okay, this is it's it's not like we're making these glass slides to to do something, you know, with a computer and, and make some quantitative measures. We certainly do that, right? We measure um, mitosis using KI67 with an imaging system. We measure ER positivity and we can do that with AI. But that's all after we've said, oh, this slide is positive for ER. This slide has a positive KI67 mitotic rate. So let's measure it on this machine. The actual determination of the data in the system is all about a visual image or visual output that needs to be reviewed by the pathologist. So artifacts in histology or in the image of the tissue are numerous and can have, there are many types of artifacts and they can have multiple causes. So when we detect these issues in the tissue by either, this can be done by either of the following 
sort of processes. We could, and this is our this is our quality control, right? This is our process control. This isn't what we just showed in the case. In the case, it was the latter, right? The feedback. But our process control is spot review. Okay. So for every slide that's produced, you you have either a percentage of cases that you look at the slides or you look at every slide. And so it depends on the volume of your lab. It depends on the number of technical staff you have, the amount of time your laboratory manager has. But if you are putting out, you know, 50 slides a day in your laboratory, it is possible for the technical staff to look at every single slide before they go out of the lab and check them and make sure that they look, they all have the same quality, the staining is accurate, you know, there's not any issues. You obviously for special stains where you need to run a control to make sure that the stain work, you're going to check the controls, but you can also spot check some of the special stains just to see if the color and everything is, is correct, there's no damage to the tissue. But that and that's different because checking the special stain controls is required before you leave it out. But when you're when you're just putting out your H and E's for the day, you can again randomly look at them or you can look at all of them, and that's going to help you catch issues before they go to the pathologist, so you can fix them, and that's will ultimately save time um, and not not delay the the diagnosis. If you wait for feedback from the pathologist, remember they have to look at every single slide because they have to make the diagnosis. They're going to be able to say, "Oh, I found this one slide; it's bad." You know fix it, or they're going to say, oh, everything was bad today. And that's not the kind of feedback you want, because now you've lost a day of productivity for those cases, because you're going to have to go back and fix the problem, maybe reprocess the tissue, recut the sections, and then the pathologist has lost a day of signing them out. So spot review is really the best approach in process control, and you should, you know, log it and document it. And if your lab is not a very high volume lab, looking at every case is reasonable, looking at every slide to make sure it's okay. Once you get to a high volume, and I'm talking about producing, you know, 100, 200 slides a day and not having, you know, a lot of technical staff, if you only have two or three technical staff and you have two or 300 slides, that may be daunting to do that. So you may just decide to look at every other slide or maybe every fourth slide or every fifth slide just to do that quality check. Because likely, you know, an individual block problem is easier to fix, right? That That's like that calcify block, but a chatter problem across a whole bunch of cases is a much, much bigger problem that you need to, you know, you'll have to investigate to fix. So these are the, the two ways to do this. And unfortunately, the only way to improve upon this, um, which is not available to everyone, but is an option is to use um, a whole slide imaging or a scanning process where every slide that is produced is then whole slide imaged and then can be checked by a computer to say there are errors or whatever. But that's really an advanced um, kind of way to do it and isn't necessary for the most part because we all have, you know, we know what our slides are supposed to look like. We have enough time. It doesn't take that long to flash that slide up and look at it, um, but it may be very difficult if your volume is, is really high. Um, so what types of data are needed to do the isolation of the root cause, right? So this is a really important process. In our case, we have a pathologist giving us feedback. This isn't our spot review, but in either a spot review or in the pathologist giving us the feedback that something's wrong, what do we need to know about that? that case, right? What kind of logs do we need to have in order for our process control to be effective, right? Because we don't want to say, well, we don't know where this, when do, we don't know anything about this block, so how can we fix it, right? That's not where we want to be. We want to know everything about that block. So we want to know where did the block come from? And I don't mean, you know, just, you know, it, it, it came from a breast that we grossed. I mean, where did that breast come from, right? Who sent you that sample? When did they send it to you? How long was it fixed for? You know, how long did it travel and be transported? Because sometimes the artifacts that we see are related to poor fixation prior to our tissue processing. And that's important to know because if it's poor fixation prior to our processing, there's very little we can do to fix that block. But if we know that, oh, it came from the OR, it was brought over to the lab within two hours, it was in a refrigerator, and then we cut it and processed it that same day into formalin. Well, we know pre-analytically that tissue was fine. So anything that was wrong happened after it came in the lab and we can likely fix that. So where did the block come from? Documenting date, time, location, um, and then how we processed the block. Who grossed it in? Where did they put the formalin uh, fixed cassettes? How long before it was processed on the processor, et cetera, et cetera. Next question is, what is the tissue? This is also very important. If you don't know what the tissue is, you don't know if there's a risk of it being calcified and you may have to decalcify it. Um, it may be very fatty, which requires more fixation before you process it on the processor. It may be very lean, which means you can over-process it. If it doesn't have a lot of fat in it, it's mostly protein. You can actually over-process it if you use too high of a setting. So, so in labs,
firms that are um, very busy, that have very diverse sample types, they will actually divide things into short runs and long runs, not because of any other thing than the size of the tissue, because a very small biopsy on a long processor run is going to get fried and destroyed, and you can't do anything with that. But a very big, thick piece of tissue, if you don't process it for longer, is going to be unfixed and a mess. And so having that kind of workflow built in is how we keep this from happening, right? We say, oh, as a technician who's looking at the bench and grossing this block, I'm saying, oh, this is a big piece of fatty tissue. This needs to be processed for longer. Or this is a tiny little biopsy. This needs to be on a short biopsy run. And that, that whole concept of short versus long runs is related, again, to tissue volume. And it's something you have complete control over. But if you don't have that in your process, right, if you don't have it in your workflow that we're going to divide these out, then your small biopsies are either going to always be over or under processed or vice versa, depending on how you're doing your, your tissue run. Um, how long was it fixed? So remember, we receive things in the lab fresh, and we may put them overnight to fix, or they may sit in formalin for a week before we get to them grossing for whatever reason. And that's really important because certain tissues, if they overfix, they'll get crystallization, more crystallization and have to be decalcified. Others will get excess formalin pigment, especially if the temperature is off uh, for the formalin, et cetera. And then very important, when and who processed, embedded, cut, and stained it, right? We need logs to know which day was it processed, you know, for which processor, um, who, who embedded it, who cut it, who stained it, because then we can isolate exactly where a problem may have occurred um, to see what's going on with that particular case. Again, um, as I said, is a visual profession. So when an issue is found on a spot check, right? If we if we do our spot checks, it can be corrected before the pathologist reviews the case, possibly even you know within a couple of hours or the same day, depending on what the problem is. But when an issue is found by the pathologist, it has to be corrected after the fact, and this will delay results. And so this this whole idea of taking you know say. 30 minutes to review all of our slides before we send them to the pathologist can save a whole day before that patient gets that diagnosis. And that's a very, that can be very crucial in a new cancer diagnosis, for example. In either way, when an artifact is encountered, it requires more thorough review to determine if there was an issue with a single block, for example, like fixation or calcification, a single workstation problem like chatter, as we described from like a loose microtone blade, or a systemic problem like processing, right? And as you can imagine, a single block problem is easy to fix. A single workstation problem is probably going to be a little bit more difficult because you're going to have to possibly go back and recut all those slides that have that chatter in it. And then there's a systemic problem like processing, which means an entire processor run may either need to be rerun or separated out and rerun depending on if it's fatty tissue, for example, that didn't process correctly. So it's always better to prevent these things from happening than have to fix them after the fact, but there are ways to, as I said, to fix them once you see what's going on. Okay, because individual slides are challenging to review, several data collection points are needed to ensure quality control can be pl in place. Um, and these include, documentation of cold ischemic time, receipt, grossing, and formalin fixation. So this sounds um, very daunting because those are all pre-analytical values, right? We have to ask the laboratory, I mean, the clinical lab that's submitting a sample or the clinical team, excuse me, that's submitting a sample to us, you know, when did you actually take this sample from the patient? Like at what time on Thursday did you take it out of the patient and either put it into formalin or put it in a refrigerator, right? Because if they put it in a refrigerator, and let's say you don't get to it for 24 hours, that's the cold ischemic time. And that actually has downstream impacts for different kinds of staining and processing, et cetera. If they put it immediately into formalin, but it's a really big piece of tissue, it's not gonna fix all the way to the middle. And so the middle can actually start to rot and degrade and you won't get very good histology. So knowing when they collected the sample and when they put it in formalin is very helpful. And then obviously we wanna document who, who, who receives it in the lab, how they grossed it, and when they, if they put it in formalin fixation or if it was already fixed in formalin because all of that information will help us figure out what's wrong with that sample. The second is documentation of which processor run or block was run on. Now, Many labs only have one processor, right? And you, and so just having the day, and you do one processor run per day, so having the date that the processor run was there is sufficient because you know, oh, that's the one run that we did. If you have more than one processor, or if you do more than one processor run a day, your data documentation is gonna have to be a little more complicated because you're gonna have to know this block was run on the morning run on machine one for Tuesday, right? And so you have to have a log um, to keep up with that. And as you can imagine, 
All of this is much easier with an electronic system, um, but it can be done with paper and it is very, very helpful uh, for your process control if you have this, this information. And then documentation of which technical staff perform microtomy and staining. When I worked at the Brigham, we had, uh, when I was a resident, we had to gross in cases, right? And I'm sure many of you have is either seen or have grossed in cases yourself. And we have what was called a grossing sheet, which had, you know, the date, and then it had the case number and the number of blocks, the number of pieces of tissue in each block, which again is a process control we can talk about. And then at the end, we wrote like how many special stains we needed or anything we needed up front. But our initials were at the top. So when a histology technician received those blocks to cut and they said, oh, there's something wrong with this block, they knew exactly which resident had grossed it in or technician and they could go to that person and say, hey, there's something wrong with this block, right? So that kind of like paper communication of the journey of the tissue through the laboratory is really crucial. It can be electronic, but it can also be paper. And it's really crucial to tracking down, for example, let's say I grossed in a case and I said there were nine blocks um, and the technician goes to cut the case and there are only eight blocks. Well, they know they can come back to me and say, are you sure there were nine blocks? And I might say, oh, you know what? There were, I wrote down nine, but I ended only up submitting eight. I'm sorry, that was an error. Or maybe I say, oh, there were definitely nine and the ninth block in my dictation is supposed to be X, Y, Z. And so we can go and start the next step of trying to figure out where that block is. So this documentation, again, across, of the journey of the block or the tissue through the laboratory is one of the most important pieces of your qualitative process control for histology. And then it's important to keep up with the lot numbers of staining reagents, which is kind of obvious, the same for special stains, immunohistochemistry, et cetera, because if you start to get a failure of an antibody or a failure of a stain, maybe it was a bad reagent and you can check that by looking across other things on that same lot number. So let's do another polling question. Um, let's see, here we go. All right, so a solution for the challenges seen in these images is likely to be which of the following? So I'll give you about a minute to answer. All right, so here are our results. So it was about even, actually half and half said increased training for a specific technician or changes to process. So the, the, the best answer is probably changes to process because we know that the pathologist gave us this feedback and we had to do this whole investigation. Whereas perhaps if we changed our process to do spot review, these cases would have never gone out and we would have caught them in advance. So that's probably the best answer. However, once we figure out what the cause of this particular problem is, increased training for a specific technician may be uh, one solution, depending on if all this, the samples were from the same technician, but we don't know that. We don't have the data to support that yet. Um, and likely we don't need to replace equipment, but what we need to do is check our equipment, right? Maybe the blade, the disposable blade needs to be changed. Maybe it needs to be tightened, but the equipment is probably okay. It's probably that it needs to be adjusted. Okay, great. All right. Let's move on to case. Now, does anybody have any questions about that particular case? You can go ahead and start uh, putting them in the Q&A. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and um, move on to the second one because we don't have any questions right now. So I'm gonna move on to the second case. But if you have questions, go ahead and, and ask them in the Q&A. All right, here is the second case, the pesky positivity. So the clinical team that treats patients with breast cancer reaches out to the laboratory to report that a decrease has occurred in the number of women with breast cancer that are ER positive on immunohistochemistry. You review the data from the immunohistochemistry lab and find the following and note that for all of this data, the lot numbers for the ER and PR antibodies and all reagents, including the control slides are the same from January 13th to March 29th. And our data is within that range. So 
there's no difference in our reagents throughout this data. And so this is the data that we see. We have for each data, each and this is quantitative data that you can generate in the lab. This is part of quantitative process control, but you can see it's an aggregate. It's not related to an individual slide. It's related to aggregating data um, across the lab. So for, for weeks, February 1st through March 22nd, for each week, we have the number of cases, the number of breast cancer diagnoses that were made, and you can see those numbers there. We have the number that are positive for ER, the number that are positive for PR, and that the controls were checked and that they worked, right? So the first thing we do is we look at our control check and we see that the, um, we see that the, the controls all worked, right? We have yeses all down there. So as far as we know, our technical team, our pathologist, whoever does our quality control for IHC has looked at our controls and said they worked that day, okay? And then we look at our positivity for ER and PR and note that the positivity for ER and PR is not a one-to-one -one correlation. That's actually okay. Biologically, we know that not every ER positive case is PR positive and not every PR positive case is ER positive. But for those that are ER positive here, we would expect to see a little bit of correlation and we see that. So the positive cases for PR are, are pretty much coordinating um, with those. So that, that doesn't look abnormal to us. We also note that those numbers are approximately the same every day, right? That makes sense. And when we look at the number of breast cancer diagnoses, we can see that as we move down the list around February 22nd, we started increasing in numbers of cases, right? And that that's not unexpected. Maybe, you know, something changed in our delivery of cases, etc. But that is definitely a change. So let us ask the question, what are the trends in positivity for ER and PR in the caseload? And what do these trends suggest? What other trends do you notice in this data that may be important to consider? And what questions would you ask to determine the issues with your IHC staining results? So let's look at the trend first. So here's the trend for positive, this is just for ER. And what you can see is that we were around between 86 and 100 percent. The, the reported ER positivity for most populations is around 75 percent, right? So if, if our number is a little bit higher, that's okay. Maybe we're a referral center and we're only getting certain cases. Um, if it were a little bit lower than 75 percent, you know, who knows, maybe we have a longer, you know, longer processing time, ischemic time, we don't know, but, but the number should be around 75%. And so our, from February 1st to February 15th, we were doing okay. We actually had pretty good ER positivity around what we would expect. But notice on February 22nd, we dropped to between 46 and 53%. So almost in half from where we were. Okay. Um, so Here's our polling question. What is the trend in the positive for ER in the data and what is the mathematical reason for it? So let me pull up the trend. Sorry, one second. Case three. All right. So what is the trend in positive for ER PR in these data and what is the mathematical, not mathematically, sorry, mathematical reason, right? What is the mathematical reason why we're seeing this number? about 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, so here are our results. So, most of you, about 40% said in decreasing, that is correct, right? We can see that the positivity is decreasing based on that percentage that I showed you. And, and it's due to increasing caseload. Remember the question was mathematically, like from the, from a, just purely from a mathematical point of view, why is this number smaller than before? And it's because the caseload, the number of breast cancer cases has increased, right? So we can't say anything about the antibodies not working, the controls not working, um, you know, for the first two answers, because as far as we know, the controls worked, and we have no we have no data in this figure to support that the antibodies aren't working. Mathematically, we can explain these results because the caseload has increased. So it's really important to make sure that when you are looking at data, that you you can make the observations that you can make. Right? Don't try to overinterpret or underinterpret. Just say what can we tell about this data and what we can see in this data. 
is that, um, sorry, one second, is that these numbers are double what they were before, but these numbers, the positivity for ER, haven't changed and therefore the percentage is going to be half of that right so and that doesn't tell us anything about the cause right this is just interpreting the data this just says okay the reason our positivity is different is because the number of cases have increased in this column and the number of positivity have not increased now we need to jump in and say why is that the case why is that happening all right Okay, so, so notice here, these numbers, as we said, are increasing, and this is the mathematical reason for that percentage to fall, and now we need to figure out why that is, okay? So the quantitative output that we're monitoring for our, for our process control is the percentage of cases positive for ER and PR, and we have what we call a general target or a benchmark of around 75%. Right? There's not really any other way to kind of do process control for, for ER for breast cancer, right? We can't say, oh, every case has to be positive or every case has to be negative. All we can do is say, well, the positive control has to work, which we have that data. And then we want to look at our percentage positive to see if it's hovering around 75%, maybe higher if we're a breast cancer focused clinic, but again, should be around 75%. Our recent data has shown that the positivity has dropped to 50%, right? So that's, that's, weird, you know, and so we have to ask the question, like, what is the change in the data? Well, the only change we note in the data is that the number of cases being submitted has increased. It's basically doubled, right? That's all we can account for. So this accounts for our mathematical change in our findings, but how do we explain the change in positivity, right? Is it a problem of our test or is it a problem of our tissue samples, right? And so now we have to investigate, right? We can't, as we did in the poll, we can't just assume that we know what the answer is. We have to investigate and see what that problem is. So here's the next polling question. And this is the one that it's a, it's, it's a little bit difficult, but I think you guys will be okay. Let me find the right question. Uh, stop sharing results. All right, we're going to case two, question two. All right, so assuming the patients come from the same background population, okay? And that the ERPR positivity rates should be the same, right? So we're assuming that this is the same women who've been presenting as before, which of the following is a possible cause, okay? Is it increased numbers coming from a new clinic with poor collection quality control, increased numbers of cases with transport having long formal and fixation time, income, increased number of cases with biological differences, or increased numbers of cases with exactly the same collection process? This is a tough one, but, but just think about it. If we, if we have double the number of cases coming in, but our ER hasn't changed, how could we, what are some possible explanations for that? And just to, just to give you a little bit of a prod, there's only one correct answer. The other three are, are not correct. So unlike the other ones where it's possible those are the answers, this one is really only one particular answer can be correct. I'm gonna give you a little bit more time because I know this is a tough one. All right. All right, there we go. So now you guys are all voting. Here we go. Give you some time. And we are, we're at 40%, so let's end it there. And, oh, hold on, I can't, okay. All right, so hopefully everybody can see those results. So what you can see is that about 30% of you said increased numbers coming from a new clinic with poor collection quality control. And then the rest of you said the other case. Well, the answer is actually the first one, increased numbers coming from a new clinic with poor collection quality control. Now, why, why do we think that's the most likely answer, right? What are the most possible cause? Well, let's look at the other reasons, okay? Increased numbers of cases with transport having long formal and fixation time. Well, we know from the literature and from studies that long formal and fixation time does not actually affect ER positivity, okay? It, you shouldn't fix it for an, an incredibly long amount of time, for years, but for, for, for long fixation time isn't the issue. What's the issue is long cold ischemic time. Right? So if that breast tissue sits in a refrigerator for three days or sits out on a shelf for three days with no formalin on it, that's called the cold ischemic time. That actually massively affects the ER and PR positivity on immunistochemistry. 
But fixation time is not that bad. We, when we looked at long fixation times, for example, in studies from Nigeria, we found that it went from about 75% to about 70%, right? So maybe a 5% decrease, but certainly not falling in half, okay? That's not what we would expect. Increase, the second answer is increased numbers of cases with biological differences. So we've said that this is the same background population of women, right? This isn't a new group of women. It's not another village. It's not from another country. So we can't actually think that a biological difference is the case. There's no reason to think that that would be the case. And in fact, when we look at, you know, women in the United States or women in Europe or women in Africa, and we segregate them by race or background or genetics, et cetera, the ER positivity rates still hover around 75%. There's not that much of a difference around that. So that we don't, we can't expect that this is just some random biological difference. It has to be something more specific. And then increased numbers of cases with exactly the same collection process. Well, that's very unlikely because if everything pre-analytical is exactly the same, then why is our ER positivity different? Because we know our controls have worked and we know our lot numbers for our antibodies are the same, right? So barring some disaster in the freezer that we don't know about because we don't, we haven't seen that yet, there's no reason to think that that's the case. So likely there's, there's probably new, a new clinic, right? Because we've got an increased number. So that has to be a new source of material. It's not like a, an existing clinic is going to suddenly double overnight. So it's probably a new clinic and they probably have poor quality, poor collection quality control. They have too long of a cold ischemic time and that's damaging the ER and PR uh, hormone receptors. All right. So, so in this scenario, all of our internal quality checks are in place, including the control slide checks and our lot number consistency. So we've done our job, right? We've, we've documented everything. We can show that our lot numbers are fine. Our controls were all fine. We can even go back to the controls and look at them all those days if we needed to, but, but we've done everything correctly. So the most likely explanation is a pre-analytical problem with the tissue, right? We don't know what that is, but the, the, question, the answers I showed you in the polling question, that was the possibility that those were the pre-analytical problems problems. But, but so that's why that was the right answer, because it was the only pre-analytical problem that made sense. But we don't know for sure what it is. But upon further investigation for this particular case, the new influx of cases are found to be coming from a new clinic that just opened. When we reach out to them, we learn that they have spotty access to formalin, so they dilute it with water and no refrigeration for tissue samples. And they can only send samples to the clinic with a three-day delay. So there is a problem, right? So we, we recognize that that's an issue. They've got to be fixed in formalin with at least a tenfold volume. We all know that from our AP lab experience. Um, if they can't be fixed immediately, they need to be refrigerated. And if they're not being refrigerated, that's bad. And delaying with those two things in place, if they're delayed for three days, they're not getting informalin or proper formalin for three days. So that's gonna definitely damage the tissue. So all of these factors lead to a longer cold ischemic time for the breast tissue, which can degrade the ER and PR positivity rate in the tissue. So what is your role? Like, what is your role in the lab? If this is your case and your scenario, what are you supposed to do? Well, what, what we've done in um, so many of the countries I've worked in is we've done outreach from the laboratory to the collection sites to, to give them a little, a little brief talk on this is how you collect samples, this is how much formalin it should be in, this is, you know, this is how long it should take you to get it to the lab, et cetera, et cetera. And that's very powerful because when you have that communication and that outreach so that they know that you're talking to them and you are you are going to, you know, be monitoring what they're doing, then it's, you know, it's, it's very, very powerful feedback to do that. And they may say, well, you know, we don't have, we don't have any way to get formula. Well, maybe your lab can supply them with formula and maybe there's a revenue stream for you to, to sell formula into that lab for them to use it. Or maybe you're just providing it um, and recycling it, et cetera, depending on your workflow. But it's, it's very important to remember that that pre-analytical piece is just as important as the analytical piece. And you have just as much responsibility and control over that as the clinical team does to, to make sure that you're getting good sample quality so that you can give them a good result, okay? We have a quick question here. Do you prefer, do you pr prefer purchased control or lab prepared control for IHC stain? Because controls play an important role. Right, so controls for IHC are um, very interesting because they are essentially tissue, right? Tissue from a laboratory that could be from a mouse. It could be something that's been made mock, for example, in the case of special stains or it could just be a previous breast cancer case that was strongly ER positive. So if you purchase, let's say you purchased a control and you have about a four month supply of that control, okay? And then 
a month into it, you find a breast, you have a breast cancer case that's strongly ER positive. And let's say a month later, you have another case that's strongly ER positive. You probably have other ones, but let's say those two were strongly ER positive. Well, you can take those two blocks at the end of that four months because that case has been signed out and you don't need the material anymore. You can take those blocks and you can actually yourself melt them cut the tissue, let's say into smaller pieces, and then re-embed re them and create new tissue block, new control blocks, right? So you can actually take a piece of an existing case that you know strongly ER positive and use that as your control. And you obviously wanna repeat that against the control to make sure your re-embedding process hasn't damaged it. But then when you run out of your purchased control, you can now use your laboratory created control to do that. But you need to document that. You need to you know, say this control came from this case, uh, it was strongly ER positive relative to this purchased control and therefore using that as, a, as our control going forward. And then as you move ahead, you can continue to replace your controls with existing cases. And this is what we did, you know, at the Brigham because it, it just becomes extremely expensive to purchase controls. And if you have a large volume of, of different kinds of cases, you can generate your own controls. And there's no, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad practice. It's perfectly fine to generate your own controls as long as you go through a documented process that, you know, this case was ER positive based on our previous purchase control or other control, and now we're using it going forward. Um, and then, okay, so answer that one. So the next question is, what could be the other possible cause for the reduced possibility if there wasn't for the new clinic? That's a great question. So, um, so, so because of the increase in volume, we always have to say, is there a new source of material? If we go back and we don't have a new source of material, but let's say our clinic that we normally get our samples from has just suddenly doubled their volume, perhaps now they have a new surgeon, like who's more aggressive with doing biopsies. Maybe they have, um, there's a new bus route that's available in the country that people from a certain district hospital can get to this clinic that couldn't get there before, right? Maybe there is a, a whole series of district hospitals where a, a patient who survived breast cancer has gone back and done community outreach. And now all those women are reporting to this clinic for their biopsies and they're coming over, you know, in larger numbers. So it, there's lots of possibilities for if it weren't a new clinic with poor um, a new clinic with poor collections uh, collection process for why we'd get an increased number. But we also have, we have an increased number with a drop in our positivity. So it's unlikely that our, our existing clinic that has good practices is going to suddenly start having bad practices. It could be the case. Maybe they ran out of formula, or I'm sorry, they got new cases and they ran out of formula. Maybe it's a, a multi-point, a multi-focal problem. Maybe they got a bunch of new cases for any of those scenarios and the new surgeon is very flippant and doesn't, doesn't fix them long enough, right? Maybe it's an individual person that needs to be trained. But the key there is that there's a pre-analytical problem based on our data, there's a pre-analytical problem that we need to investigate. Um, so George is asking, concerning IHC stain, what usually happens, either difficult to decide for decision for requesting restain, right? So if you, I think what you're asking is if you, if the pathologist says, you know, the stain didn't work or we'd like to have, you know, I, I'm not sure I need a new stain. How do you decide to do a restain? Well, if you look at, you take the, the case you stained and the control and you look at them and you see nothing wrong with that case or with the control of that day, it was the positive control worked just fine, but the actual case didn't work and, and the pathologist expected it to or the stain doesn't quite look like they want, um, investigate the tissue, you know, make sure that it was fixed properly. There's not an issue with that particular case. Um, and then you can repeat it if requested, but don't be surprised if you get the same result because IHC is not an exact science, right? It's not only a subjective interpretation by the pathologist, the, 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 actual, um, the actual output of the chemical process that you're doing is not exactly the same every time you do it. And so there, there can be you know, changes in the tissue that you don't know about that just prevent the reaction from happening. It could be that the woman is ER positive, but there was some, you know, damage to that particular block that we can't account for in our process controls, et cetera. But it is, it is important to, you can request, you can restain cases, but it should require a conversation with your technician and your pathologist to understand exactly what the pathologist thinks is wrong. And if the pathologist can't verbalize what they think is wrong, then, then, you know, you, you have to be you don't want to restain things that are not necessary. I'll give you a good example. Let's say a woman comes in in for the first time, has a biopsy, and it's strongly ER positive. 
right? And she presents a month later with a positive lymph node, with a lymph node, um, and they biopsy it, and it's still again breast cancer, and you do the stain, and it's ER negative. There, there's a biological question, right? The pathologist wants to be sure that the biology of this woman's tumor has changed from her primary resection to her metastasis to her lymph node, right? They want to say that, well, this is no longer ER positive. But, but you, so you may say, okay, we'll we repeat that stain and let's say it comes up positive. Like, oh, well, it was just an error somewhere in the process and it is now positive and it's fine. So that would be a biological reason. And that's just an example that that could happen. Um, another question, what other likely challenges should be the lab looking out for after establishing the practice at a new clinic? That's a great question. So when you work with a new clinic or a new recipient, the most important thing, most important thing is the requisition form, right? They have to be using your requisition form that you have vetted to say, this is the information our laboratory needs in order to take your samples in, process them and give you a result. So number one thing, make sure that the requisition form is vetted by your lab and that they have access to it and they're using it. The second is the quality process. Do they have formalin? Do they understand volume of formalin to use? Do they understand quality control and, and making sure that the cold ischemic time is low, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the third is communication, right? On that requisition form, you need an email address, you need a phone number. When you get the case and you look at it and there's a problem, you wanna know who you can call so you can make sure that, that that can be corrected as quickly as possible. When you get the results, you wanna know exactly who to get those results back to as quickly as possible. So requisition and quality processes are the two most important things when you have a new clinic come on board. Okay, next question. What is the possible cause of HER2 staining nuclei in breast cancer, but the control on the same slide stains cytoplasmic? That is a fantastic question, Aisha. Um, HER2 is a nuclear stain, okay? So if the control doesn't have nuclear positivity, right? That, is, that, is that right? Is that, am I saying that right? You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna table that question because I don't wanna tell you the wrong thing. And I'm gonna have my breast expert answer that because that is... I know the answer to that question, but I think I'm saying it wrong. So let me table that one and I will get you the answer for that one. All right, let's move on to the next case. That was all the questions. That's a great question, Aisha. I will get you the answer to that. Okay, question, case number three, persistent pigment. So during routine review of slides at the end of the day, so now we've got, we're doing a spot check, right? We're doing our spot check within the lab before we release them. You note the following on a slide of a liver and here's the image. Um, the liver is, it's not a great histology image, that's okay, but you can see, what can you see here? You can see formalin pigment, right? All this gunky, chunky black stuff in here is formalin pigment, right? And it should be very easily recognized. Um, for those of you who live in malaria endemic areas, um, you can often get lymph nodes or liver biopsies or spleens, especially from surgery or autopsy that have a lot of pigment in them. And that can be from malaria pigment, but that looks very different. Um, malaria pigment polarizes and formalin pigment doesn't quite polarize. Um, but it, it, is, it can be hard. But typically when we see this, it's formalin pigment um, and we can recognize it pretty easily. All right. So your laboratory makes its own formalin, right, for tissue processing. So you buy formaldehyde, you dilute it with water, uh, distilled water, and you pH buffer it. And then you use recycling for formalin. So after you use formalin, you put it through a tissue recycler, I mean a formalin recycler, and you get fresh 100% formalin out, and then you use neutral buffered, or you buffer it so that's neutral buffered formalin. So you review the logs of the pH buffering for the formalin and you see the following. So you can see we have the weeks, February 1st through March 22nd. We have the techs and it looks like there are two technicians who are working with our formalin to do the buffering. We have the volumes that they were working with to create or buffer or recycle, whatever. And we have the pH check. Now, neutral buffered formalin means the formalin should be at a pH of 7.0, right? So here's our pH check. And you can see that for the most part, it's around seven, right? Should it be exactly seven? Sure, it should be, but for very large volumes, this can be a challenge. And so this may be acceptable. Remember, our, we would have to determine what our coefficient of variation is for our pH meter, which we don't have that here. But let's say we determine that the CV for our pH meter is about 0.02, then we're okay, right? This is okay. The, the one on February 8th maybe is a little bit of a problem, but the other ones are okay, right? Because they're, they're within the, 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 the spectrum of the um, pH meter. So based on this image and this data, what additional questions should be asking to determine the root cause of this issue, right? So we, we, our formalin looks okay, right? We have a tissue block, 
we're looking at, I'm sorry, we're looking at a slide, we see formalin pigment, but our, our formalin in the lab appears to be okay during the period that we used it, right? Based on our logs, because we have all this data available to look at. So did we see formalin pigment in any other tissue that was fixed from this batch of formalin, right? So we know the batches of formalin, we know the, the date it was made, the technician, the pH of it. We can go look at other tissues that were coming from that same block for that same week to say, did we see any other formalin pigment, right? Did we see formalin pigment in any other tissues that were part of the same processor run? Maybe something happened with the formalin stage of the processor run and it just sat in formalin for 12 hours and we didn't know about it. Um, highly unlikely, but that could be the case. So we have to do that. Or do we see pigment in any other cases from the same clinical service, right? There's another, again, this is a, a, a pre-analytical question. Maybe it was, we could, we, our formalin looks okay. Maybe it was fixed in formalin before we got it and that formalin wasn't okay. So that, those are the kind of the questions that we wanna ask. So here's our next polling question. Give me one second. Uh, oh, sorry. We're gonna go to question five. All right. So why is visual review of histology slides important for process control? This isn't a question specific to this case. This is kind of a review question, but why is visual review of histology slides important for process control? And our options are because the final use of the slides is visual, quantitative, objective, or by clinicians. About 20 seconds. Great, all right. So very good. Almost all of 62% of you said because the final use of slide is visual. That's exactly right. If the if the output that you're using, if what your you know your your pathologist is going to do is visual, then your process control has to be visual. You can have a quantitative process control, but if but if the quantitative process comes back and says everything looks fine, but the image still looks like garbage you know, which is the case here, right? Our pH, our numbers all look great, but the image still looks like garbage. So this is a a visual output, so it has to have a visual control. We have to have control of that image going forward. It's not quantitative because the 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 final use of the slide is not quantitative. It's in fact qualitative, okay? And the final use of the slide is not objective. This is very important. It's subjective, right? When a pathologist looks at a slide, they are subjectively giving their opinion about what they see on that slide, okay? Now, when they count mitosis, that's a little bit more objective, or they say this is ER positive based on the parameters you have, that's a little more objective, but their interpretation of the, whether or not this is breast cancer is subjective, okay? And because the final use of slides by clinicians, no, the clinicians never see the slides in most practices. They may see an image of the slides, they maybe hear about the slides from the pathologist, but the pathologist is providing a report to the clinicians based on that. And so the clinicians are not ultimately using the image, uh, they're, they're just using the results of that image. So very good. All right, moving over. Okay, so anatomic pathology for surgical pathology samples is complex, right? Because one team collects the sample using one set of materials and reagents, and a second team processes the tissue to a glass slide with a second set of materials and reagents, right? It's very rare that a clinician uses the same vat of formalin that the laboratory uses or uses the same source. Now there are possible, there's possible for you as the lab to provide everyone in the hospital with little containers of formalin that you've made and you've buffered neutrally, but that isn't always the case, right? And in most places, for example, even in, in Boston or in Chicago or where I live here in California, you know, if I go to a clinic and they see something on my arm and they want to take it off and they put it in formalin, the probability that the formalin in that jar from that, that they put it in came from the lab that's ultimately going to read it is zero, right? Because that clinic has purchased that formalin from some other supplier and now, and they're just using it and now it's going to that lab. So this is a very important concept because 
their pro their pre the pre analytical piece is partially processing the tissue right they are fixing it in formalin just a little bit you know as much as they can um, before it gets to you and that's going to affect the work that you do so any but any issues that arise in the visual presentation of the tissue are somehow arbitrarily blamed on the laboratory right and we all know this is true if the pathologist doesn't like the image or the there's something inadequate about it they automatically say what did the lab do what did the lab do but the lab isn't necessarily the cause and often isn't the cause if their process controls are in place for for how to deal with these tissues and so that that pre piece again is important and i showed you a a, a qualitative one uh, before and now we're doing more of i'm sorry we just showed a quantitative one before and this is more of a qualitative question of of pre-analytical issues so here's our next polling question Next polling question. What steps would the should the laboratory take to correct this problem based on the data presented? Okay, so we we looked at our logs. We know our formalin was okay, but we still have formalin pigment. So what steps are are going to help us fix this problem? We have four options: improve the process of buffering the formalin internally, additionally training the specific technicians, assisting clinical team with improving quality of formalin, or eliminating the recycling of formalin by buffered formalin only. So remember, we had our technicians were alternating on our data. It didn't look like there was one particular technician that that was you know an issue. Uh, our pH was within the CV of our pH meter, so the pH looks okay, right? So about, I'll give you about 10 more seconds. Great, all right. So very good. So 50% of you, very good, said assisting the clinical team with improving the quality of formalin. That is most likely going to fix this because our buffering for formalin terminally seems to work just fine, right? We have our pH documented and you know shouldn't be an issue. Um, it wasn't a specific technician, right? We had the logs of who had done the pH buffering and the pH buffering was consistent and it was across different technicians. And eliminating the recycling of formalin and by only buffered formalin only is gonna massively increase the cost of the operation of the lab. So we would never choose that as an option unless it was absolutely necessary. So the correct answer here is assisting the clinical team with improving the quality of formalin. So in this scenario, further investigation into the source of the sample revealed that the clinic submitting the sample does not have neutral buffered formalin and rarely sends samples. So they use whatever formalin they have in the laboratory. So this is a big red flag, right? If you if you look at all of your in all of your clinics or all of your sites that are sending you tissue and you see in your registry that you get one sample a year or one sample every six months from a clinic, that's probably a clinic that you want to reach out to and ask them, you know, you know, how do you do your formalin? Where do you get it from? You know, why do you do so few biopsies, et cetera, to kind of investigate a little bit further because you're likely going to get poor quality from that clinic. If you've got a clinic that's sending you five samples a day, that's going to be much easier to detect a problem, but also less likely to have a problem because they're going to have a process in place to do that, although it can still happen. But when you've got a new clinic or a rare clinic that's very rarely sending you samples um, or a rare source, you really want to take some time with them and reach out to them because that communication is obviously always good to make sure that the lab is communicating well. But they may say, you know what, we can't get formalin, what should we do? <clears throat> and you can say, well, do you have alcohol? If you have alcohol, you can put it in alcohol and that's perfectly fine. Or if you have you know, if you have a refrigerator, put in a refrigerator and we'll schedule runs, you know, you can work out a plan with them. <clears throat> or more importantly, if their biopsies are really rare, then if, if they know in advance that they need to do one, you can have some formalin sent to them just for that biopsy to be done and do that. But again, the, the question is, is what can you do to help that laboratory improve its pre-analytical quality? Because that's ultimately going to affect the product of what you're putting out in your laboratory. So education and assistance with the site and access to neutral buffer formalin will increase the quality of the tissue processed by the laboratory and remove the formalin pigment, you know, that's that's pretty um, obvious. So Aisha has a question, how long the tissue to be kept in the fridge before fixation? This is a great question. So if you have a properly functioning refrigerator at about four degrees C, um, 
even a large piece of tissue, especially like a breast or something from the OR, is probably okay in the refrigerator for a, a shift, what we call a shift. So about 12 hours. So if you do a breast cancer case at 8 a.m., and the, the mastectomy sample is wrapped in a towel, no formalin, no fixation, and put in a refrigerator that works properly at say four degrees C, um, is put in the refrigerator at it's say 8.30, let's say it's at 8.30. If you get that breast by the end of the day, it's probably okay. It would not be okay to go overnight, right? So, so refrigeration is, is, is really a temporary barrier for preventing degradation to the tissue, but it can't be for a very, very long period of time. Now there are some, some rare examples of ways you can do things with placentas, including freezers, but that's not really for routine practice. For routine practice, um, using a refrigerator to really be a, a conduit between the surgical OR and the, and the pathology laboratory is okay. Um, but for a clinic that's, that's you know a rural clinic that's say two hours away from you, um, that's only gonna bring samples once a week or send samples once a week, they really need to be using formalin. And if they're grossing, if they're, if they're doing large samples, like big samples, they may need some education about how to pre-process that tissue, right? How to describe it, ink it, slice it up and put it in formula before they send it to you. Otherwise that patient should really be going to a surgical suite that's nearest to a pathology lab because that, that interaction needs to be um, very quick. All right. So, so Aisha says, some surgeons place tissue in normal saline and they keep it in the fridge when they don't have formalin available immediately. Yes, that is okay. But again, that's going to be that 12 hours. You don't want it to sit in formalin. You don't want it to sit in saline, you know, overnight or for four days. You know, you, it, the idea if the surgeon is doing that is that they're going to get it to you, you know, within that business day, you know, in the end of the day or maybe a second shift, but not, not overnight because it's just, it's going to degrade immediate, start degrading immediately. And the cold temperature and the saline will slow that process down, but it is still happening. So you want to get it in formalin um, as quickly as you can. All right. Um, case four, multiple mucicarmins. This is a lot of reading, um, but hopefully it will be okay. So your laboratory currently performs four special stains routinely, including a methenamine silver stain for fungus and bacteria, a gram stain for bacteria, an acid fast stain for mycobacteria, and a mucicarmin stain for mucin and cryptococcus. Because of the limitations of supply, you make your own control slides from strongly positive cases or by working with the microbiology laboratory to make mock positive cases. And we talked about this before, why that's okay. This is just an example. Your logbooks for the special stains record the date, the technician, the positive control check, and the number of stains performed on cases that day. You use a new log sheet for each lot number of each special stain. Because of the limitations on reagents and numbers of requests, special stains are only performed on Mondays and Fridays. You have two technical staff in the laboratory that are fully trained to perform all special stains. A researcher approaches the laboratory to request that cerebral spinal fluid be made into cell blocks, formalin fixed paraffin embedded pellet blocks, and that mucicarmin is performed on them to identify cryptococcus for a clinical trial in HIV positive patients. The researcher expects the volume to be 10 patients per day, and the results are needed within 24 hours to start therapy. The anticipation is that most of the cell blocks will be negative for cryptococcus. Because the research has a grant and is paying the laboratory twice the normal rate for performing the stains, plus a fee for making the cell blocks, your laboratory director wants to take on the grant work. Now, I don't know how many of you have been in a situation like this or have have, you know, can, can relate to the situation, but where I worked in Malawi for many, many, many years, this would happen to the pathology lab literally about twice a month. Some researcher would come in and say, oh, I need you to do this. And it would be like, I'm going to be sending you five placentas a day. And it would totally throw off the work of the lab, you know, what they need to do, et cetera. Or, oh, I need you to do immunistic chemistry and I'll pay for those reagents, but they wouldn't pay for any other reagents. And so it, it became a challenge. So, so this is, this as in my experience, is something that labs do anticipate and have happen. So this is why I think this is a good case. But the crux here is that we have a process. I've described the process for you completely. And now someone's asking us to change that process. Okay. So here's our first polling question. This is going to be case four, question one. All right. When considering an external project which may generate revenue for the laboratory, which of the following is the most important consideration? Will we make money? Will we improve our current process? 
Will our routine cases be unaffected or will we be able to hire new staff? So what is the best answer there? All right. We're getting much more confident in our answers, about 10 more seconds. Actually, we're at 50%, we're good. All right, so great. So more than 69% of you, wonderful, said, will our routine care be unaffected? Absolutely. You're, it's very important that you actually be able to take on grant work as a laboratory um, because it's extra revenue. It may bring in a new technique uh, that you didn't have before. It may provide a service to your patients that increases their care. Um, it may allow people in your laboratory to have publications which can advance your academic program or your, your career, et cetera. It may allow you to have new training to improve the way that your laboratorians can, can have skills and do work, et cetera. But the most important thing is, will our routine care be unaffected? Can we still do our normal work for our normal patients and take on this work, okay? Um, the other considerations are obviously questions that you want to ask, but they're not the most important consideration. The most important considerations, can we still do our job? Okay. And then our second question, a second polling question is, all right. What changes to your process control must be put in place to take on this work? Okay, do we need to have additional training for staff? Do we need to increase the runs of all special stains per week? Do we need to increase the runs for only Musi Carmen? Do we need to do more than one of these or do we do none of these? So what do you think about this one? I'll give you about a minute. All right, so most of you said more than one of these. And so there's a, there, there's, this is kind of like a two, two ways to answer this question, right? So two people said none of these, and we'll come back to that in a second. But for those of you who said, you know, picked any of the other answers, you're making the assumption that you're gonna take on the work, right? You have decided, yes, making cell blocks from CSF and processing them in formalin and staining them with Musi Carmen um, is the right way to approach this project. And we can do it if we add new staff and if we increase runs of Musi Carmen, you know, and adjusting our process controls, we can take that on. It'll be more revenue. That is a process we can do, right? And so for those of you, 55% who said more than one of these, yes, if you decide to take on the work, as I described it to you, additional staying, training of staff and increased runs of Musi Carmen are the way you would have to go, right? But for the two people that said none of these, um, you know, it's a very interesting option. What if you say to the researcher, hey, you know what? That's actually not the best way to do what you're doing, right? And, and you know it's gonna disrupt what you're doing. You're gonna have to have new staff, training of staff, and you're gonna have to do new runs, even though that it may be revenue, but that's, that's, a, that's kind of a big disruption. But there's actually something else they could do, which may be even better for the patients in the long run. And we'll look about that in just a second. So, What changes? So we could increase personnel and hire new staff as, as many of you, or even hire new staff as many of you said. We could train additional personnel within the laboratory. So we only have two people trained. Let's say we have a total of six staff. Maybe we train two more people and now the work is much easier. We can, we're definitely gonna have to add special stains runs, right? There's no question we're gonna have to add addition, additional runs because we've got 10 patients a day and they need the results within 24 hours. So we're gonna have to have additional log books, additional controls, checks, 
And we're going to have to buy more reagents, right? And those are all considerations. But we also could suggest to the researcher that maybe they should consider another test for cryptococcus. For example, there's a latex agglutination test that can be done directly on CSF, and that is much better than a mucicarmine stain on a cell block, right, for determining if the person has cryptococcus. So, you know, it, it's, it's always this, this kind of him and Hob between, well, here's a potential revenue for the lab, but is this actually the best science for this patient? Is this the best science for this study? You know, latex agglutination is a much better, you know, it's a much better test. It's much more efficient. It's much cheaper. Um, we can still do it. You can still take it on as the lab to run it for them, but it's, you know, because if you have the capacity to do that, but it's just not going to disrupt your flow and it's actually going to make more sense. So this is a little bit of a trick question in that, you know, there's this carrot of, hey, we could make more revenue if we do this process, but is that overly involved process of taking a cell, you know, a CSF and making a cell block and trying to do a pellet, all that sort of stuff, which he's happy to pay for, is that actually the best scientific approach? Or should we say, hey, sir, Mr. Researcher, that's they're trying to do this with HIV patients, have you heard of the cryptococcal latex agglutination test over in the CP lab or in our lab, you know, can do it, which may actually be better, cheaper, faster, and, and more efficient for your patients, right? All right. So with that, I'm going to take any questions. Um, I have a couple that are here, so I'm going to go ahead and answer. So George asked from the previous case, formalin pigment was a problem in our setting, St. Paul, he's in Ethiopia. Does this highly affect IHC? Um, so the answer to that question is yes, but not for the reason that you think. So the actual presence of the formalin pigment in the tissue is probably not going to interact with the antibodies or cause you know, a disruption staining. It may, especially if it's excessive, um, but that's not the main problem. The main problem is that formalin pigment is brown, right? And brown formalin pigment looks just like the brown reaction for your immunohistochemistry. So absolutely, if you have a slight a tissue section that has way too much formalin pigment in it, it will be very hard to interpret the immunohistochemistry if you're using the brown reaction because it's gonna look like the formalin pigment and it'll be very hard to, to decipher that. Um, there is a process to remove formalin pigment from tissue, uh, which I used in a research setting to study malaria, which is um, picric acid dis dissolution. You can dissolve it with picric acid, but that absolutely destroys immunohistochemistry, so you definitely can't do that. So the best thing to do is to try to prevent the formalin pigment from forming in the tissue. Um, next question, are there chances of seeing formalin spots in the case where both the formalin internally and that used by the clinical team seem to be on point? Um, yes. So what you're asking is, let's say the clinic that we're getting the formula, let's say, you know, either we make the formula for them or we know they're buying it from a reliable source. Um, so if you take a tissue sample and you put it in high quality formalin uh, and you leave it there for three months, right, you're still going to get formalin pigment because neutral buffered formalin does not stay neutral buffered if it sits on a shelf in a hot, moist environment, right? M moisture seeps into the container from the humidity on the outside, temperature causes evaporation, that all changes the pH and eventually you can get formalin to start to crystallize in that tissue. Um, so absolutely, you can have process control logs for the pH of the tissue of the of the formalin when it was made that say that this is perfect formalin, but then the time in formalin formalin is the problem. If it sits in formalin for months, then you can absolutely, especially in environmental conditions that aren't perfect, you can definitely have formalin pigment form um, in, the, in the tissue for sure. Um, okay, and then for the case of, of FNAC materials, when you see a lymph node aspirate suspected of tuberculosis, which material can be used for a pause control during a ZN stain of a smear? That's a great question. So um, mycobacteria are, um, challenging for many reasons. Certainly doing an FNA smear and doing the doing the acid fast stain, you need to have a control to do that. So and, and so what can you use? So one option is to work with the microbiology lab to create a mycobacterial sort of pellet or suspension that you can then mix with some, you know, some tissue and make us make a smear from that. Um, that's not ideal. Obviously that takes as much challenge as anything else. Um, so what, what I know labs have done is they use the, con the histology control um, for the Zill Nielsen along with the cytology. And why is that okay? Well, the process for doing the acid fast on the 
cytology is very similar, uses the same reagents as for the histology slide. And so as long as there's not a, a completely different step, a different acid or a different, fit, you know, a different method of using the staining, once this, uh, the slide is fixed, the cytology slide is fixed, then it is okay to use the histology slide for that, right? Because you're, you're basically doing the same process to the tissue. If you have to do something very different, you know, if you're doing a fight stain where it has to be in vegetable oil, you know, then you have a problem with using the histology control because it's not quite easy to do that. Um, but that's a great question. And I think that the, um, the answer there is, is primarily you can use the histology control, which because it's a special stain run um, that you're doing, but um, you can also create cytology specific controls. But I think that that's, that's kind of overcomplicating it and isn't really necessary. Um, how does the subjective slide interpretation by the pathologist factor into the overall qualitative process control for an AP lab? That is a wonderful question. So we've talked about the, the analytical, sorry, the, um, the internal concepts, right, of taking a piece of fresh tissue from a patient and turning it into a glass slide, like that process, okay? And in and, and, and the quantitative and qualitative ways, we can do that in anatomic pathology. But there's the whole another piece, which is very important, thank you for pointing this out, blessings, where the pathologist is looking at the slide and we need to have some control over that, right? We need to know that the pathologist doesn't have a bad day, that the pathologist is well-trained enough to make the diagnosis, that the pathologist doesn't miss a cancer because it's really subtle or rare or a type they've never seen before, which is possible. So how does that happen? So there are a couple of approaches. One of those is EQA, external, external quality control, which I believe, sorry, external quality assessment, which I believe we have a whole section on. Um, and, and that is really testing the pathologist, spot testing the pathologist's ability to diagnose cases in a controlled environment, right? So you send them three cases a quarter or five cases every six months that they look at and they make a diagnosis on or they make an observation on that, that has a specific answer, right? So even though pathology is subjective, if you have 10 pathologists reach a consensus on a case and say, this is definitely invasive ductal carcinoma, bloom Richardson grade three um, with lymphovascular invasion. Like they can, they, they all say, yes, we agree that is on this slide. Then you can use that in EQA to send it to a pathologist and ask questions like, do you see lymphovascular invasion? And it's, you know it's there, so it's a yes, no question. You know, is this a bloom Richardson grade three? You know it is, so that can be a yes, no question for EQA for them to do that. You can also ask them just say, what is the diagnosis? And they can say invasive ductal carcinoma. So that EQA process is checking the knowledge of the pathologist, right? It's checking their ability to, to be able to make diagnoses. And it's a very important kind of process for laboratories to have in place. And unfortunately, there's really not um, a lot of external EQA or EQA for anatomic pathology in Africa. It's a project we are working on at ASCP, um, for example, with Rwanda uh, as a pilot, but it is it is very challenging to do that. And that, that same process can also be for the histology lab for technique, right? To make sure the technique is working. But that doesn't help with the day-to-day -day work, which is what you're more asking about. You know, day-to-day, -day, how do we know the pathologist didn't make a slide on that, that make a mistake on that slide or that slide? So there are a couple of ways um, that a lab can do that. One is, uh, consensus. So let's say there are four pathologists in the lab and every day they sit down at say two in the afternoon and they all look at cases they're having trouble with, right? Cases they're not sure about, you know, cases that are, are difficult, et cetera. And so they all collectively look at it and they come up with the diagnosis together. And so that keeps the pathologist knowledge holes from being a problem, right? It, it fills it in. That doesn't help if the pathologist misses something, right? So how do we do that? So there is um, what's called internal, internal audit, which is another lecture that you're gonna get. Um, and in an internal audit, you, you a, a different pathologist goes and randomly looks at like 10% of all cases that were signed out in the last week and just checks them, double checks them to make sure they agree with everything that's in the report. So an internal audit is a retrospective way to, to look at the, you know, to look at what's happening with the pathologist subjective knowledge. But I think when we think about, um, when we think about the, um, you know, the, the process control, this particular lecture, process control, quality control, et cetera. In anatomic pathology, we are trying to encapsulate it to the production of the slide, right? We're, we're trying to say from the, from the receiving of the tissue to the production of slides that need to be interpreted, that's the part that we want to have a, a, an intact process in the laboratory that we're consistently using so that the glass slides that are produced are 100% 
perfect and accurate every time. Th they can be read subjectively by the pathologist. And then the, the piece after that where the pathologist reading it, as I said, falls under EQA and audit, right? That, that's really where that happens because the idea of quality control becomes very difficult because it's a subjective read, you know, and it, it can be challenging. One thing that does help with cancer, specifically for cancer diagnoses, are standardized reporting. Okay, so the ICCR, the International Collaboration on Cancer Reporting, has uh, templates available for how to sign out cancer cases. It has all the relevant data that you need to collect from that case. And that is very helpful in creating a process around cancer for pathologists so that it's process control. And you can have someone check those, you know, weekly or monthly to make sure they're filling them out correctly and that they're doing everything correctly. And it's really a great knowledge check for the pathologist because it reminds them of all the things they should be looking at or thinking about for that particular cancer case. So that's a great question. Thanks so much. Um, all right. Next is, how can one tell that formalin being used on the tissue is good or not, right? So that's a great question. So if you, if you buy formalin and it says that it's neutral buffered formalin that you're purchasing, um, it should be okay. If you're buying it in bulk, like a large vat, you can obviously use your pH meter to check to make sure that the pH is, you know, is 7.0 and that the formalin is there. Um, you can certainly test your batches of formalin. N normally people don't do that in the lab uh, because they use so much of it, they, they're gonna kind of test it just in their regular workflow. Um, but that that is another possibility is just to test it on tissue to make sure the fixation is happening and you're getting good fixation with the tissue. But for the most part, formalin, you know, formalin that's mass produced is usually okay. When you're making your own formalin, um, you know, from formaldehyde or from recycled formalin, the key really is, is the, the documenting the chemistry process of making the formalin from the formaldehyde, going from the 40% to the 10%, the dilution that you do with the distilled water, so the quality of the water, et cetera. And then the pH, checking the pH after you've done that dilution to make sure that it's it's neutral and buffering it if it's not. Um, and then for the latter, when you're recycling it, obviously it needs to be clear. The, the recycler needs to be working. So the formula needs to be clear, like water, like it should look. It should be visually clear. There shouldn't be anything in it. And then the pH needs to be balanced on that. But you don't need to add a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff to it. You just need to check the, the pH and buffer it. So typically when you're purchasing it, it's usually acceptable unless you, you know, you just get a bad batch from a company because you, you know, that that's a problem with a vendor and you have to reach out to them and deal with the customer vendor relationship. But when you're making it yourself, it's all about that process of documenting how you did the dilution of your formaldehyde and or um, the recycler and then buffering uh, to get the pH correct. Um, okay. In your practice, how long should a histopathology laboratory be practicing without being accredited by any accrediting authority? So this is a great uh, question, Fred, thank you. So accreditation, accreditation is, what is accreditation? Okay, accreditation is a badge that you receive from an external body that says you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, okay? And, and don't, don't let it mean anything other than that to you as the laboratory, right? It is an external validation that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. That, and that's all, it, that's all it can say, right? Um, if, you, if you win an award for quality or you win an award for outstanding service, that's saying you're doing above and beyond. You're, you're beyond what you should be doing. You're an awesome laboratory, that's great. But if you are accredited, that simply means there's a set of standards and guidelines, you know, or a checklist or a tracking process, whatever, and you've met those standards or guidelines, right? And why is that important? Um, in what context is that important? Okay, so let's say we are a private pathology laboratory in Florida, in the United States, right? Where a lot of old people live, uh, they have a lot of lab tests performed all the time. We're a private lab and we wanna compete with four other private labs, all right? We want to be accredited because that is external validation that we're, you know, that we're doing what we're supposed to do. Okay. If all the other labs are also accredited, then it, it removes the competitive advantage. Like everyone is accredited is fine. But if we're the only accredited lab, then it does provide us some advantage to do that. And eventually those labs will have to catch up and be accredited as well. But at the end of the day, what you're doing in the lab, your internal processes, your QMS methods, all the things that you're doing to produce high quality results, you're doing that because that's your, that's your quality management system that you've put in place, everyone is trained on that you're doing it. 
all the accreditation is doing is coming in and saying, yes, you're following your process to the letter and producing the results that you're supposed to produce, okay? So if we move over to, to Africa, let's say to uh, Kenya, like Nairobi, for example. In Nairobi, there are public labs, right? There are public anatomic pathology labs, the Kenyatta Hospital, the National Reference Lab, um, et cetera. And there are private labs, Aga Khan, and lots of little private laboratories all around. In that setting, right? being accredited may provide you with some competitive advantage. It may provide you with the ability to get business that other people can't get because you can say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm accredited, so I, I'm better than the other labs. Not really, you're doing what you're supposed to do and the other labs can't externally show that they are doing what they're supposed to do, right? So you can say, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and this, this external body has said that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So you can trust me with your sample, right? So it may provide you that competitive advantage and, and those other labs may not be able to afford accreditation or maybe they don't actually meet the standards so they can't be accredited. So there it is value. But when you go to Blantyre, Malawi, where there's just the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital laboratory and there's the College of Medicine Hospital uh, laboratory and then there's um, Mayawatu Private Hospital and that's it. There's only three labs in the, in the, in the city, right? And the same pathologist runs all three labs. <laughs> you know, um, or maybe two pathologists run all three labs. Having, if, if all those labs are following their process and doing what they're supposed to do and producing slide results that are, that are readable, accreditation isn't going to change that, right? It's not suddenly like Myawatu would be accredited and suddenly everybody only wants their samples to go to Myawatu. People can't afford that. They're gonna still have to go to the hospital, et cetera. So accreditation is, is a, as I said, it's an external marker that you're doing what you're supposed to do. And it's important to, to laboratory leadership, it's important to hospital leadership to be able to say we're accredited because then they know that the lab is doing what it's supposed to do and someone externally has told them that and they don't have to do that checking themselves, right? They can, they can see that an external laboratory body expert has, has said this group is accredited and, it's, and they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. But you, you have to remember, it's very important, there are accredited laboratories, right? They have an accreditation mark and they still get shut down. Right. They still maybe they, they still can be doing things wrong that are violations and they get shut down because accreditation isn't it's not it doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean everything you do is exactly the way it's supposed to be. It means everything on this list that we say you have to have checked off or everything in this tracking process that we say you need to do is correct. But there can still be things that are happening in the lab that are wrong that will result in, you know, the lab not being where it's supposed to be. So I think accreditation is you know, especially programs like SLMTA, where you can see increase or improvement in the lab processes, that's very different than just getting, for example, SANUS or CAP accreditation, right? Those are a one-time event where they don't have any relationship with you. They just come in, inspect, and they say, yes, you met the qualifications or you didn't. Whereas SLMTA, you know, is an improvement process, right? Where you start at one star and you move up to five stars and you know that you've improved it. And when you get to five stars, the idea is that you keep evolving until you can then achieve accreditation in another laboratory. But in and of itself, um, it isn't saying anything about your lab, except that you're doing what you're supposed to do, right? I just want to be very clear on that. It, it doesn't mean you're better than anybody else or you're worse than anybody else. It means that you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do based on this accreditation, as opposed to, um, you know, you having a perfect QMS system and you know your lab is doing everything it's supposed to do and your results are great and your quality controls all work and your pathologists love all your results and everything is fine and your patients are getting taken care of, et cetera. You're doing your job. And then all accreditation does is say externally, someone saying, yes, that is correct. You are doing your job. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, how, okay. How often in a year should EQ be done for a particular AP pathology laboratory? Thank you, Fred. Another great question. So routinely, um, so if you look at the College of American Pathologists, which does proficiency testing for the US for a lot of anatomic pathology labs or ASCP, which has products like uh, something called CheckPath, which are these are assessment products. Those are for both groups. Those are sent out quarterly. So every three months you receive, uh, if you subscribe, and these are all fee services. These are, there, there are very few situations where this is free, if any. Um, you receive a batch of slides or use a tissue block, whatever they're gonna send you or images, you may receive whole slide images every quarter with a set of questions. And then you answer those questions and you get them in and you get the results um, of your individual lab as well as the results of how everyone else did in about a month after you do that. 
So quarterly is what is, is recommended for an anatomic pathology lab. Um, how do you report IHC for cases, let's say breast HER2, if the control score is plus two and this case scores plus three? So again, it depends on what your control is supposed to score. If your control is always a three plus normally, like every time you've run it for the last month, it's a three plus and suddenly your control is a two plus, right? Then you have to step back and say, why is that, you know, are we at the end of the antibody? Uh, did anything change in the process? Um, did we have a power failure? Like what, what could be the reason for this to suddenly go from two plus to three plus? Because if it's the same control, the same tissue block that you've been using for months, why would it suddenly change, right? Did the lot number change, et cetera? So you definitely want to investigate if the two plus is different from what it should be. If it's supposed to be a three plus and it's gone to two plus, you would investigate. If your control is supposed to be a two plus, if it's always a two plus, right? That's what you've used as your control, then it's totally fine for your, your case to be a three plus, right? So it depends on the context of what your, your score is supposed to be. Um, are there specific controls for specific tissues in the histology lab or does each station in the lab get its own control? That's a great question. So what we use for controls are basically by assay, what we'll call assay or stain type. Okay, so if you're doing an H&E, um, essentially a good histology lab will have a set of, you know, two or th they may have what's called a sausage, where they have a tissue block that has eight or nine little tiny pieces of tissues in it, and they cut one section of that and they run that with every H&E batch, and they know that all what all those nine tissues should look like. So that's one that's one way to do it. Another is to have, you know one control block run for a processor that you then stain to H&E to make sure that the processing and the H&E is functioning. But at the end of the day, it's it's essentially one per, you know, volume, like so one per run of the processor as a control can be included or one per run of staining for the day can be included. But you don't need to do a control for every time you do an H&E, right? Obviously that would be ridiculous. So it's, it's usually done on a, a, that's kind of what we call daily QC. So we QC the formalin, I mean, sorry, we QC the H&E staining once a day with our control slide that we know what it's supposed to look like. And the really cool thing, even without a whole site imaging system or a scanner, you can actually photograph that slide every day using the same conditions with the camera. And then you can keep a log of that. So you can document that your H&E stain, what it looks like every single day. And if you see it start to fade or the bluing starting to go out or the pink starting to, to become too pale, or whatever, then you know, oh, something's wrong. We have to fix the stain. So you could actually do a, a trend comparison of your stain by looking at the, of an image of it in a system or a digital system in order to check that. And that's very easy. You can do that with very low tech, right? You can just take photographs and keep them in a folder um, every day. And you can see the thumbnails of those photographs and see if there's a change in the quality of the tissue. Um, for special stains, it is typically one control per run. So if you're gonna do Musi Carmen on Tuesday, you need to have one control slide, one control slide in there being stained with any other Musi Carmens that you're running. And that's pretty standard. So you wouldn't, you always run a control every time you run a special stain, but it's by batch. Like if you do a batch of AFBs, you run one control AFB. Um, for immunistic chemistry, it's a little more challenging because you need to run a control per antibody that you're staining. So if you're doing 25 ERs for 25 breast cancers, you need to have one ER control in the run, right? If you're doing, um, if you're doing, you know, five CA, I mean, um, sorry, my brain is blanking, SMA, smooth muscle actins, then you need to have one control for smooth muscle actin in, in the run. So you do that. So that, that becomes a little, obviously you can see if you have a lot of complex IHC happening, it becomes very complicated to do that, but you do have to have a control per antibody per day. Now really intense laboratories will run negative controls for certain um, IHC. Not every laboratory does that, um, although it's recommended that you do negative controls. And that's where you take a known positive um, and you uh, a known positive and you run it without antibody just to make sure that everything is included except the antibody, just to make sure that the assay itself isn't causing a brown reaction or whatever color in the tissue um, when the antibody isn't present. And that, that can be very helpful for um, certain types of assays that have um, a lot of interference um, and it should be part of your routine to do that. Um, let's see, we have, because of its nature, I found it difficult, but 
lastly made accredited the AP Private Lab in Addis by Joint Commission International. All oh, right, so this is just George. Let us know that the Joint Commissioner International did accredit his lab. It is very difficult, um, but they have been accredited, and it is possible to be accredited. I will say, you know, remember that when you are an anatomic pathology lab on your own, or or even as part of a larger lab, you can just have the anatomic pathology lab be accredited. You don't have to have the whole lab be accredited. You can just have the AP lab be accredited, um, and it's some degree much simpler because it's such a it's a simpler process, right? It, it's 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 all all the all the samples are being done exactly the same thing, and then it's really the IHC and the special stains that can be challenging. Um, but it is possible uh, to obtain accreditation just for the AP lab. And if you're interested in your lab director or your hospital wants you to do it, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. It's absolutely valuable, but it is a cost. There's a cost associated with it. And, um, you know, you probably have better, th more important things to spend the money on initially, unless your lab is really, you know, high functioning and ready to go and in perfect shape, which if it is, congratulations, definitely go for accreditation. Um, but if your microtome is on its last leg or you need a new processor, because your processor is almost broken, I would not try to be accredited. I would try to get my equipment replaced, for example, um, before I embarked on that process. Um, I think that is our last question. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, I think uh, I will say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will get an answer for Aisha's question. I'll remind you it is, what is the possible cause of HER2 staining nuclei in the breast cancer, but the control in the same side stain cytoplasmic? I, I feel like the answer to that is that cytoplasmic only staining in HER2 is, is not okay in a control that has to be nuclear. Um, and so you need to rerun the control because the control didn't work. Um, but I, I will double check and, and I'll make sure that answer is in the next registration email um, so that you have it. So thanks everybody so much for joining us. Uh, we have another session. Oh, um, oh, Adam asks, what tissue would you use for a sausage? Okay, this is a good question. So just so everyone is clear, um, a sausage is where, we call it a sausage, but it's essentially where you take um, little tiny sort of like three millimeter by three millimeter cubes of different tissues and you put them into one block so that you have a whole bunch of different tissues represented. So what I like to include in a sausage for, you know, standard H&E and even it's a good for IHC control um, if you need it is um, a little piece of breast cancer, um, liver, a little piece of colon mucosa, um, a uh, uh, lung, some, a tiny piece of lung, a piece of a lymph node. Um, you don't need fat so much, but some skin is very helpful. And there's one other thing, um, muscle, sorry, mu a little piece of muscle um, and a little piece of nerve. So if you have all those, and again, you're gonna have to work with an autopsy group primarily if you wanna make a really good sausage. Uh, but if you have those pieces, then that captures the bulk of your, um, a lot of your immunohistochemistry and your H&E. Uh, if you want it to be a little bit more elaborate, you could add a couple of other cancers in there, especially if you, if you have really common cancers like prostate cancer, or colon cancer, um, stomach cancer, esophageal cancer. If you're seeing those routinely, you might want to add a little cube of those as well. And then you, you'll have a nice cross section um, for that. Um, and then another question just came in. Could you give a ballpark figure for the cost of anatomic path EQA programs per annum and accrediting by the JCIA? So I would defer to George to let us know what the approximate cost for JCIA is. I don't actually know that off the top of my head, but for anatomic pathology EQA programs, depending on the number of samples you request per, or the number of specialties you request, because they're usually done by specialty. So you get like a derm path EQA or a heme path EQA. Um, they're typically uh, several hundred dollars per specialty um, to do that. However, as far as I know, and if anybody has different, please let the group know, there are not currently any anatomic pathology EQA companies that service Africa. We've checked into this. There may be some now. It's been with COVID happening. Um, I've, I'm a little off my game in knowing, being up to date on that. But the last time we checked, which was in late 2019, early 2020, um, there were not any available. Um, and any companies that did have that service, if you asked them about providing it to Africa, it was extremely expensive and, and probably not worth it. So what we're proposing, and I'll just give everybody a brief overview, what we're proposing um, is an internally 
uh, created EQA program. And what that sounds really weird, but what we mean is um, if you have a country where you have a laboratory, a, a national reference lab, for example, that doesn't do anatomic pathology, which, which can be the case, um, that laboratory can actually serve as the EQA monitoring agent for all the anatomic pathology labs in the country. And they need some basic equipment. They need a microtome and they need, you know, probably a microscope, et cetera. But at the end of the day, they, they can create EQA material to be sent out. And then that material can be vetted um, using remote access, things like um, telepathology or static images, et cetera, so that you don't have to send stuff back and forth. You can just send out the materials in one direction from the EQA source, and then those laboratories can look at it. And then those labs themselves can submit cases to the monitor to say, here are you know, eight cases that we have over the last six months. There's, you know, a breast cancer case, a colon cancer case. There's a, you know, a, a lymph node that's benign. There's a lymph node with tuberculosis. They can send, you know, eight or 10 cases voluntarily to the EQA source. And then that EQA source can then use those for future EQA down the road. And they can, you know, dissect the blocks, re relabel them so that it's not clear where the blocks came from or what patient, et cetera. And then they're able to send those out to other labs um, to do EQA as well. And so in that way, the cost is really reduced to the transport of the materials and the time of the, of the reference lab. But if the reference lab is already producing the EQA materials for other types of testing, it's kind of part of their workflow. So it doesn't actually add that much cost. Um, so that's one way to approach it. That will work if you have multiple anatomic pathology labs in one country. Um, if you're a smaller country and you only have one or two labs, then maybe perhaps clustering with several countries is another approach to do that. And you still need that you know central group that's going to be the main EQA monitor um, but in that regard you know you're you're sharing cases you're sending out images and you're getting uh, external benchmarking on the work that you're doing and that is sufficient to say the EQA practice is, is working for this laboratory um, all right so what is a good non-cancer normal HER2 control to use oh that's a good I'm going to get that answer for you as well because I don't want to tell you the wrong thing and I will put that in the um, I'll put that in the registration email for the next time. All right, so I think we're um, at time and thank again everyone so much for coming. Uh, I really appreciate um, everyone's participation in the polls. We're going to try to do that going forward. I hope you enjoyed the polls. I think I did because I got to hear, see that you're actually listening to me and feeding back um, and we will see you on Thursday.